I have an interest in the people that are buried in the post cemetery out here. And I know most of you, if you've lived in our area for any length of time, have taken a walk underneath those beautiful cottonwood trees and taken a look at those small marble white stone markers and probably ask yourself, I wonder who that was? Or why did he end up here? How did he get here? What did he do before he got here? And so we did some research. When I say we, some of you that are in the audience tonight uh, have contributed, and we came up with some answers and a lot more questions. So what I want to do tonight is to take you on a journey uh, through time and space, time back to 1877, and space all the way over from here to Idaho Territory and Whitebird Canyon. Everybody know where I'm talking about? Who doesn't know where Whitebird Canyon is? Okay, by the end of the evening, I hope you do. I'll, I'll show you some maps and give you some ideas. If you have questions during the show, just raise your hand uh, and I'll answer them right then and there. If you wait till the end of the show and you're like me, neither one of us will remember what you were gonna ask. So, you ready to go? You have that feeling for uh, that period of time now? <laughs> Fort Walla Walla was an important part of the Indian Wars. Uh, from 1855, when the treaty was signed, uh, there were some conflagrations that went on in the Northwest. Uh, Fort Walla Walla was built during that period of time. 1858, uh, we had uh, some troops stationed here. And over the intervening period of time, almost 20 years, we still did. Uh, we were a territory, Washington Territory. Oregon had already become a state, and Idaho was not yet even a territory. They were still part of us, Washington Territory. If you go down to the Post Cemetery and look around, one of the things that you're going to find are all those markers. And if you're like me, you look at them and you say, I, I'm, a, I'm a little confused. This one says Cottonwood Canyon. This says Whitebird Canyon. This has a name. This has unknown soldiers. Uh, what's going on? So I want to explain some of that to you tonight. 1855. The Nez Perce Reservation that was a result of the 1855 treaty was almost seven and a half million square acres. It was huge. And at that point in time, uh, everybody was kind of satisfied with it. It, it wasn't the greatest idea, uh, but it came out to be a lot of land and nobody was under pressure to move off of it at that time. But that didn't last for long. Pretty soon, things started going uh, fast in the West. Uh, Oregon became a state, 1859, was the 33rd state. We had 33 stars on the flag, and we could see room for even more. And before you know it, they discovered gold. Gold in Idaho. 1861, what happened? People came through Walla Walla on the way to the gold fields, and once the gold was discovered, all of those treaty things went right out the window. When the miners moved in, they didn't really care if it was this guy's land or that guy's land. All they were concerned with was the gold that was there. And they went after that gold. And that led to conflicts right off the bat. So by 1863, things had changed. And people in Idaho, there were more than there were before in 1855. And they said, we want to be a territory of our own. And they broke away from Washington. We became Washington territory that looks pretty much like our state does today. But Idaho was made up of Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. An awfully big piece of ground. And all through that area, there was gold. Well, the problem was that unilaterally, without even conferring with the natives, the United States government said, we're going to shrink this. And they shrunk it all right. They shrunk it by 90%. They brought it down to that small area you see in the diagram. Now that led to some problems for sure, because where you would have traditionally gone out hunting and foraging and camping and raising your families and doing those things, 
suddenly it was shrunk down to a much smaller place. And a time frame was given. We want you all to be on the new reservation by Flag Day, June 14th of 1877. There were a lot of natives that didn't want to do that. And so there was a long period of time, discussion among themselves and with miners and people that were moving in, what should we do? Well, some of them did move in, and they formed that little area around Lapway, Idaho. Others, they stayed out where they were. And you have to understand that things are changing now. It was traditional. If you needed food, you went out and hunted it or gathered it. And now, if you wanted food, you watched what the settlers brought in. They brought in cows. They farmed. They ranched. They mined. They went out and dug holes in the earth, took out the yellow metal. They farmed. Instead of going out and gathering roots like chemists, now they planted seeds and grew things like wheat. There was ranching. They didn't have to go out and shoot deer and elk if they didn't want to. They could raise the meat. Problem was that if you took one or two of them, they got upset about it. Logging, all those places where you had nice groves and in the hot summer months you would take your family there and spend time in the shade, now those trees were going. They were building homes with them, building boats with them, building wagons with them. They were doing things they didn't always agree with. Trapping, they were coming in and taking the fur. First you had a little stream that went through where you camped. Then the beaver came and he made a pond out of it. And the pond attracted everything. It attracted otters and mink and uh, muskrats and things like that. And then they came and took those too. And pretty soon there were none left. And even more importantly, they came and built homes right in your backyard. Imagine if you had a backyard, a fairly good size one, and somebody you didn't know came in, set up a tent trailer, hooked up to your electricity, took your water, used your sewer, and never said a thing to you. How would you feel about that? Well, turns out the natives felt the same way. And they, everything changed for them. At one time, they could trap a beaver, take the beaver over to the trading post or to the nearest trader, turn it in, and in return for that, you would get whatever you wanted. You could buy a gun if you had enough. You could buy powder, the ball to shoot it. You could buy mirrors, ribbons, uh, fire strikers, whatever you wanted. Now things had changed. That trading was slowly fading away, and in its replace... In its place, uh, we started using money. So if you wanted a blanket instead of three beaver for it, you came over and now you had to pay money. And to get the money, you had to work for it. You couldn't just trade like you used to in the old days. And so this led to some serious problems. And to make it all worse, the one thing that turned everybody against each other was the whiskey. Everybody drank it. And I mean everybody. And when you get drunk, some of those injustices that you feel uh, become much more amplified. And pretty soon you're invading your neighbor. Settlers used the land differently too. Like uh, we've been saying all along, they saw a different purpose for the land. It wasn't to be just left alone and gather whatever it produced. Instead, it was to be made fertile and grow and, and produce the things that you needed. They looked at the land from a religious point of view too. And it was much different than the religion of the settlers that came in. The missionaries wanted the Nez Perce to follow the teachings of the Bible. The Nez Perce wanted the traditional old ways of living off the land and worshiping the Creator their ways. And then on top of all of that, as the gold came in, as the lumber became available, as all of those things prospered, by 1877, towns were growing throughout the Northwest. Towns in Washington and Idaho Territory. One of the biggest was this one right here. Walla Walla. By 1870, the population of Walla Walla was over 5,000 people. And we were a hub of activity. Uh, Doc Baker had already built his railroad, one of the first in the Northwest and absolutely the first in Washington State. And he was already shipping things by railroad. Things were beginning to change, and rapidly, more rapidly than either side could understand. Lewiston, Idaho, by 1877, it had almost 700 people. In, seven, in uh, 1880, it had grown to 739 people. And today, I think it's about 900, somewhere in there. 
I'm just kidding. Nobody from Lewiston, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Second largest town in Idaho, did you know that? Once the state capital, too. Built in, I know, they're, they're coming up with Meridian and all those things now. Built in 1862 and 63, in response to that Idaho territory, uh, the federal government built a fort. Now, Fort Walla Walla had a companion in Lapway, Idaho, and it was called Fort Lapway. How many of you have been to Fort Lapway? I know some of you have been to Lapway, but do you know where the fort is over there? There is one building left. I'll show it to you here in a little while. A small place on the way to the Salmon River, once you get up on top over Craig's Mountain and out onto the Camas Prairie, once you're up there, there's another small town called Grangeville. And Grangeville in those days was 127 people. It's a little bit bigger now. It has 129. <laughs> Mount Idaho was even larger than Grangeville. And Mount Idaho was kind of the, the seat of that particular area, that countywide area. And Mount Idaho, if you were to go over there today, uh, it's pretty much a ghost town. A few people live there, but the cemetery is still there. And you can go over and see almost all the people that, whose names are in this uh, saga are buried over there that weren't in the army. Places where the Nez Perce camped and spent time, places like Wallula or uh, Wallawa Lake, places like that were being impacted. Now the settlers came, they built cabins along the shore. They fished, and they didn't just fish for their own substance or sustenance, they, sh they fished so they could sell the fish and pack it and move it around. And the Indians objected to it, of course. Tolo Lake, small town just outside, or a small lake outside of Grangeville. Anybody been to Tolo Lake? Next time you're in Grangeville, and I know you will want to go there, next time you're in Grangeville, it's only a few miles out of town. Take a side trip, visit Tolo Lake, beautiful place. They used to find mammoth bones over there, uh, leading people to think that they might still be out here in the West somewhere. White Bird Canyon itself, when you go past Grangeville and you go out a few more miles, you'll go down a long, steep hill. All that area to your left as you go south to the river, that's White Bird Canyon. It's very steep, it's very hilly, rough country for cavalry operations, and uh, a very beautiful place to go and see. The Indians would camp at the bottom of the hill. You can see way off in the distance, there are trees. I probably don't have to show you, but let's see. Down here is where the small town of Whitebird is today. Uh, it used to be called Cottonwood for a while, and now it's named after the man that uh, was called for it. The desire of freedom, I mean, you can imagine what it would be like. That led to enough hostilities, but there was one event that turned things around. And that, was there a question? Okay. Whitebird, uh, I have that in here somewhere. And I think it was a pelican, but don't, don't quote me on that yet. I get my white birds mixed up. 1874, uh, an Indian by the name of Eagle Robe uh, was unjustly accused of stealing horses. He didn't do it, but one of the settlers just up and said, yes, you did, and shot him. Well, it went to court, and of course the man got off, and the Indians got nothing out of it. And they realized at that point there was no, no way they were going to take their grievances to a white man's court. They weren't going to get justice. Now, you've got all these changes. You've got the hostility building up. You've got the crowding coming in. And on top of all of that, there's no justice to be had. And where do you think that leads? Sooner or later, the two biggest guys in the block are going to fight. That's what they always say, and it was true. Atrocities. Well, that's how it started. The Nez Perce went out one night, and a couple of them got together, and they said, we're going to get that guy that got eagle rope. And they did, almost. But when he wasn't home, they just went and killed another guy instead. And that led to some serious problems. They went into town, the people that survived that attack, and they said the Indians are upset about something. And so they went back, and the chief, uh, Chief Joseph, tried to talk them out of it. But enough of them were angry and upset that the next night they went out and they started in earnest. They began killing. That's 
I won't go into all the names unless you'd like to go through that. Remember that they were due to be on the reservation when? Flag Day, June 14th of 1877. When did the atrocities start? The night of June 13th. Now that's a fortuitous date. At Fort Lapway was the head of the Department of the Columbia, O.O. O. Howard. O.O. O. Howard was a Civil War veteran, and he had become a department commander of the Columbia. And he was at Fort Lapway to see to it that those Indians arrived on the reservation. And when they didn't, his first reports were these. The casualty list from among the civilians. And uh, the white or pink ones, those are women. The blue ones are men. You can see what kind of jobs and who they were. And uh, at that point, there was nothing else that could be done. The army said, we've got to do something about it. Chief Joseph said, we've got to get out of here. We, the army's going to come. And when it does, we're in big trouble. And the Indians said, if the army comes, we'll meet them. We'll deal with them. And now the stage is set. Citizens demand retaliation. You can't let this go unpunished. The word reaches Lapway, a runner all the way from Grangeville over to Fort Lapway, about 70 miles or so. The word reaches Lapway around noon on the 15th. Now Chief uh, Joseph has decided that he's going to abandon White Bird, move away from that camp, and in the meantime, O.O. Howard has decided that he's going to send both troops of his 1st Cavalry out to deal with the problem. Howard had one arm, by the way. He lost it during the Civil War and got a Medal of Honor. He's quite an interesting character if you have any interest in those kind of things. Uh, look this man up and read about his history. Fascinating man. But his area that he covered <laughs> would be the future states of Washington, Idaho, and Alaska, as well as California and Oregon. He had a huge area to cover. And you know how many men he had to do it? 5,000 men. That's it. 5,000 men for all that area. He had a couple of hundred of them under his immediate command at Fort Lapway. He had a few more at Fort Walla Walla. And so he got as many as he could rounded up. But in the meantime, he sent off the men of the 1st Cavalry, Company F and Company H, went on their way to deal with it. He stayed back and tried to rally some more troops to come and give him a hand. Imagine leaving. It's 8 o'clock at night. This is in June, and if you've lived here for a long time, you know the June weather is strange. One day it'll be hot, just terribly hot and humid. The next day you have thunderstorms and lightning storms and all sorts of things, and that's exactly what happened. As the men were getting ready to leave Fort Lapway, there was a huge thunderstorm, a downpour. The roads are muddy. You have to slug it out in the dark. I look it up. That's the phase of the moon, which meant that it set early, and you were slogging along mostly in the dark through the cold, the wet, and the mud. On the trail, they made 60 miles without stopping. No hot food, no breaks. This is from a cavalry who normally did up to 40 miles a day, and they marched on. They reached Grangeville on the morning of the 16th, and they wanted to make a fire and make some breakfast. They were just getting off the horses, getting ready to do it, when who would run out except... Mr. Chapman, the man who had, uh, had friends who were killed, and he said, you've got to get up, you've got to get over there. They're getting away if you don't get over there right now and do something. You're going to lose them. you just got to go now. And uh, the man in charge, uh, Lieutenant Perry, Captain Perry, he said, all right, let's go. So the men got up. You can imagine how weary and tired you'd be after slogging through that mud. out there somewhere in the dark. The men weren't too sure what that was all about. Some of them said it's just one of those damn coyotes. Others said, I think that's an Indian. And it was. And now they knew they were coming. They knew where they were. They knew how many of them there were. And they were making preparations for them. U.S. leaders, Company F Commander uh, Captain David Perry and his co-commander, uh, Lieutenant uh, Edward Teller, and I know I can get personal testimony on this, uh, we've tried to get pictures of Mr. Teller, 
and they're very difficult to come by. Uh, we think that's him, but don't take that to bed with you. <laughs> U.S. leaders, Company H commander was Graham Thimble, and uh, Company H first officer, Lieutenant Parnell. Now that's who you have in charge. Those are your officers. The rest are enlisted men. The military had the weapons almost identical to what Custer had at the Little Bighorn almost exactly a year before. Uh, 4570 cartridges. They packed a wallop, but sometimes they could get stuck or jammed. Uh, they each carried a belt knife. Sometimes it was one they bought. The Army didn't issue it. They carried a Model 1873 Colt revolver, and they carried a Model 1873 Spring door, Springfield trapdoor. Single shot, you had to open it up each time. Hopefully it would eject, and then you stuck in another one and you shot again. You carried 40 rounds for that gun, 24 rounds for your pistol. All the other supplies, everything that uh, Howard could get together for these men was carried on six mules, or eight, eight mules. He couldn't even find enough mules to make a proper train. They took some extra ammunition, they took some food, medicine, the things that you would normally carry, but it was all carried on mules. No wagons or anything else of that sort. When they got there, they got some volunteers. Mount Idaho came up with uh, about 11 volunteers, and these were men that said they knew the Nez Perce, they knew the country really well, and uh, their only problem was that they had a real grudge against the Nez Perce. They were looking for blood. Captain Perry was looking for some kind of negotiation. We're going to put you on the reservation one way or the other, but he didn't necessarily come to fight unless he had to. Well, turns out he had to. Nez Perce leaders, uh, in Matuyalalat was uh, Chief Joseph. I won't go into all those. Yellow Wolf, he survived the battles. He was actually the war chief through most of the war, and he went to a fellow and told him everything that had happened, and it does jive with what some of the stories are from uh, military history. So we take his accounts of things very creditably. Nez Perce weapons, of course, they had the stone weapons and the bows and arrows and that sort of thing. But they had done some trading, and they had some very important weapons, uh, things that the Army did not have. And one of those is repeating rifles. 1873, if you've all seen John Wayne movies, you know what he carried. Uh, the Winchester 73 is 15 shots, and all you have to do is cock it and shoot. The Henry repeating rifle, 16 shots. Cock it and shoot. The trap door, shoot, open it up, one out, one in, close it, shoot, and repeat that over and over. So there was a small advantage in uh, the weaponry. Command and control, there were two different ways entirely of conducting your attacks and controlling your troops. The chain of command oh, chain of command in a battlefield, especially with uh, <coughs> cavalry sounds like that. <laughs> you can't talk over them. One of the things that was the problem was the military had to control their troops in battle with noise, gunshots, people screaming and yelling. All of those noise factors were involved. And how do you tell your troops where to go and what to do? And that's where the bugle came in. That high-pitched bugle sound and all the various calls that go with it allowed you to direct your troops in whatever direction uh, you wanted them to go. Understand that that would be almost like having the radio today. And what would happen in a battle situation if you didn't have the radio? How do you control your troops? Because that becomes very important here shortly. And there you have it, more noise, more, more of those things going on. And if you can't hear that, or if there isn't any, you don't know which way to go, whether to attack or retreat, or what's going on with it. There was a superior fire by groups. The military method was move as many men up as you could, have them fire in volleys. It was devastating to your enemy, and what they did to you was often devastating too. But that was the method, and the military method as opposed to the Nez Perce method. In the Nez Perce war, the individuals fought. Now they may fight as groups, a couple of friends, 
Uh, maybe one man would lead a few others to do certain things, but it was up to you to decide if you wanted to attack that way or this way or go home or whatever it is you wanted to do. And you fought for different reasons too. The military, because they were ordered. They were given orders from higher command all the way down. The Nez Perce, they had the home field advantage. They were fighting for home and family and for land and for their way of life. They had a whole different ball game for fighting. They were also fighting for profit. If they could defeat the army, they could get horses, guns, ammunition, medicine, food, all sorts of good things. They were deployed as individuals. And on this particular battle, that method was the right one. And we're going to find out why here in a moment. Chief Joseph, he told them we've got to go after the battle. There was no hope for peace after that. Once they had defeated the army, he knew that more would come. And he had to run, and the war was on. The north rim of Whitebird Canyon, as you get up there at 4.30 in the morning, the sun begins to come up. There's a little light down in the valley, and the troops began into that valley of death. As they went down the canyon, they looked around. They saw some marks. They knew the Indians were nearby. There were fresh marks in the grass. They ran into a lady coming up with two children, and she had survived one of the attacks, and she had hidden out. When she saw the army coming, she ran out, and she told them. She said, this is, this is not a good day for you to go down there and fight. They're prepared, they're waiting for you, they're dangerous, you should go back, get more troops. And of course, Captain Perry thought he could handle it. Does this sound familiar? Anybody know about Custer? Okay. The approach was simple. The blue arrows are the troopers, the green arrow are the volunteers. Now the interesting thing is, Lieutenant Teller, that fellow we didn't have a picture of, he goes out in front with eight men. He's kind of a, a point out there, and if the Indians come, uh, they attack him, they're warned, and they can form a defense. But the Indians aren't right now prepared to fight. They are prepared to negotiate. And so they ride out with a white flag. And as they get out in front of Teller and his group, uh, he's waiting for Perry to catch up now to see what's going to happen. And someone... To this day, nobody's quite sure who, even though they attempted to make peace, there was a shot coming from the volunteers aimed at the Indians. And that did it. The Indians said, we're out of here. They took off. The volunteers started after them. Perry was in no position to fight at that point, so he started deploying his men. The Blue Arrow, he started them up along this hillside. The uh, green arrows, they come down chasing after those Indians. He has a bugle at this point, and Perry directs his men where he wants them to go. Company H up towards the hill, Company F down the middle. The volunteers have the knoll of hill, but what they don't know is those few Indians that are down below here in front of them are only a few Indians. The rest are hiding down in a valley out of sight. If you were to take a look at this uh, from the Nez Perce point of view, they're laying in this grass down below, and they can see all the troops along that ridge up on top of the hill. There's a, a small interpretive panel over there, and it kind of shows you the Indian point of view from that battle. Company H, they begin to deploy. They have the saddle. They're way off to the side. And there's a rocky hill way up on the right flank, and... Uh, the officer said to Sergeant McCarthy, of all people, he said, take five men, go up there and hold that point. From that high ground, you can see what they're up to. And so Sergeant McCarthy and five men go up to that point. The rest of H Troop, they're strung out over that valley. Company F, they're to the left of them, and they're stretched out across that hillside. And to the left of them, volunteers. Volunteers, eager and ready to fight those Indians until the Indians showed up. Then it was a retreat. So the formation of battle is this. You got volunteers over on the left. You got Company F in the middle. You got Company H over here on the right. And up on that rocky knoll, you have Sergeant McCarthy. All around them below, you have the Nez Perce, including coming in above and beyond on the uh, left flank of the army. 
Now you have a dangerous situation. The volunteers retreat. This isn't what we came for. And off they go. That leaves your whole left flank wide open. Nobody there to guard it. Company F and Company H, they don't know what to do. Suddenly, you've got Indians on both flanks. And if you know military history, you know that's a very bad position to be in. And down below, more Indians coming up from the village, hidden out of sight by those hills that are down there. If you drive down the road today, you'll go right past where those warriors were hidden, right over the spot. Now, one of the most unfortunate things in this battle happens. At this point, Company H Bugler, he tells the captain, oh, I lost my bugle on the way here. <laughs> Holy jumping Jehoshaphat. Company F has one bugler left, one bugle. And John Jones, he doesn't get to use his. Perry turns to him and starts giving him commands. And there's an Indian named Firebody way over here in a hill, 300 yards away. And I'm going to tell you Firebody's story. 300 yards away with an old trade gun. And he makes that shot. And he hits John Jones. And he kills him. And now there's no trumpeter. There's no way for Perry to control the troops. They've got Indians coming in on both flanks. And now it's, an, it's a different battle altogether. If you were to walk up on the hill and look from where Firebody was sitting, which is right about there, that 300 yards up to the top of the hill looks like an awful long way. And to be done with a possibly smooth bore trade musket, that is an incredible shot. Even Firebody said it was the best shot he ever made. Did Firebody purposely shoot out the, the bugle? Did he know That's what he said, yes. This, this was war. He took a shot at the bugler and one shot. And he had it a little bit differently than the Army. They could take a round out, put another one in. He had to load with the muzzle loader. Uh, an incredible shot. If he had to take a second shot, it would have been day after tomorrow before he got loaded. Okay, Nez Perce move around, right and left flanks. Now it's starting to get bad. The Army is getting surrounded. They can look around. They can see what's going on now. They're outnumbered. They're surrounded. And the line collapses. It starts falling back. They start moving up the hill the way they came. And the men are running in different directions. Some of them in groups, some of them individually. Uh, the men that were holding the horses as the others fought on foot, they scatter, the horses scatter. It's nothing but confusion now. Captain Perry tries to rally the troops. Come on, men, stay there. And they're saying, no, we're not going to stay there. McCarthy, he's alone on that hill with five guys, right? And he can look down and he can see where they're coming around the right flank of them. And he starts picking some of them off. He starts shooting at them. Well, they're outnumbered and better shots and better guns. Eventually, five of McCarthy's men are dead. And the Indians pass by him. McCarthy then, later on, he was able to slip off that hill, go down over the side, get into the creek bottom, and escape. He was able to tell about what had happened. He was one of the few survivors that actually was on the field and saw most of what had happened. This is the view from his standpoint, and uh, his men, as you look down, you could see them coming around the side. So it's quite a distance. It was a battle there. Has he written a book, or was there a book written? McCarthy ever write a book? No. He's buried here, but he's, we don't have a book from him. We do have his citation for winning the, uh, the Medal of Honor, for earning the Medal of Honor. Sergeant McCarthy escapes. He gets away. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail on him. He stays here in Washington after winning the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, he stays and forms the National Guard, what became the National Guard, and uh, rose to colonel in the National Guard. He's buried out at Mountain View Cemetery, and uh, if you ever get a chance, you might want to stop by and see it. It's interesting. Or you can ask Marilyn. She'll show you. Show in. Captain Ferry fails to rally the troops. He was trying to get them to fight. They didn't want to. Lieutenant Trimble and Lieutenant Teller head out. Now, Teller's got seven guys with him. Those original seven guys. They stayed with him, and he took off. The route continues. Now people are being shot all over the battlefield. We'll tell you more about those individual stories. Lieutenant Teller starts up the hill. 
And it's such a steep climb that the Indians say the reason they got him is the horses wore out. They couldn't continue any further. And so they surrounded him. There was a fight. Lieutenant Teller and all of his men were killed. And uh, you can see that uh, from the highway as you pass through, right where he was fighting at. We don't have a picture of him, and we do have a picture of him. Uh, you see those 15 men in that picture? He's one of them. <laughs> and that's the best we can do so far. Believe me, we're trying. Uh, this was taken during the Modoc War of 1872, and we know he's in there. He's listed as one of those men, but not in any particular order. So we just took our best shot at who we thought he was. We're still doing that. I'll skip over some of his stuff. He was in the California uh, Volunteers before this event, then switched over and became regular army. He was married. He carried some interesting things into battle. He had a gold piece, gold watch, a gold chain, some other odds and ends that he had on him. After he was dead and buried on the battlefield, his wife asked somebody from here in Walla Walla if they would go over and get him get his remains, recover some of those items, bring them back, and have him shipped back to California to be buried. And that's what they did. She got most of those items back, too. Well, she died about 11 years after him, and uh, she was buried next to him. And then one day, the University of California decided that old Pioneer Cemetery would make a better campus. And so they transferred all those bodies to a new cemetery, and 35,000 of them were reburied in a mass grave. Uh, so if we were trying to find Lieutenant Teller today, it would be a very difficult thing to do. 33 enlisted men didn't make it out of the canyon. Let's talk about some of those. What I'm going to tell you are stories, either told by Yellow Wolf or some of the other uh, people, uh, Indians, who survived that battle. And... We're, we're using their accounts. Why not? They were there. They saw it. Their accounts are as valid as anyone else's. Sergeant Patrick Gunn, Company F, 1st U.S. Cavalry. This is an old veteran. He had already done four terms, and in those days, a term was five years. Am I right? An enlistment was five years, not four or two. And he had already done four of those and was on his fourth enlistment. He was an old hand at what he was doing. And on that day, when everybody started retreating, one of the things he did was kind of stay behind and try to hold off the Indians from attacking his men as they escaped or retreated or routed, whichever you prefer. And uh, he was shooting it out with an Esperse, ran out of ammo, apparently, and was shot and killed by one of the natives. Interestingly, when he died, he fell down and he was propped up on a bush, a hawthorn bush, and so he was actually semi-sitting after he was dead. When the army came back nine days later to look for bodies on the field, they thought he was a wounded trooper and went to him right off the bat, only to find that he had been dead, but appeared to be still sitting there and alive. Corporal Roman Lee, uh, this was a sad tale. He was uh, wounded, and he was still on his horse. He hadn't even had time to get off of it yet. And when he got wounded in the groin, he got off his horse and wandered right into the Indian camp, or towards it, and then was shot on the way down there. You can find his uh, top of the list on Company H Monument down in the Post Cemetery. Trumpeter Jones, remember him? The unfortunate guy that uh, got shot right off the bat by Firebody. Uh, he's buried down there. You'll find his grave uh, in the mass grave. There's a grave there that isn't marked for individuals, it has, as far as we know, 26 skulls and the remains in it. He's in that group there. Trumpeter F.A. Marshall, the guy who lost his trumpet, also lost his life that day. And on that soggy march across Camas Prairie, uh, no one went back and even looked for the bugle. As far as we know, it's still out there somewhere. And there were a lot of unknowns. We know who the, the names on the rosters are, but we can't identify the remains, and that's a sad thing. We'd like to know who they are, but we don't know. But we do know something about how some of them died. Wounded Head, one of the natives, uh, he and several other Indians were gathering up army horses 
when they discovered two enlisted men who were left behind. And in the routed retreat, they fought bravely but were soon overwhelmed and killed. The Indians took their arms and ammunition and returned to their camp, leaving the bodies on the field. And this is interesting because those bodies on the field remained there in the June heat for nine days. Now, you can't blame the army exactly because they were too busy chasing the Indians. That was their job. <clears throat> but when they finally realized uh, it was going to take a lot more than what they had to catch up to these Indians, and they called in more troops, they went back to form a burial detail. And you can imagine what shape the bodies were in. After nine days of laying in the open in that June heat in northern Idaho, uh, it was a terrible mess. And so what they did is, wherever the body laid, they dug a hole next to it and rolled it in, covered it over, put rocks on it, tried to keep whatever hadn't been chewed up by animals in one piece. It was a sad day. And while they were doing it, interestingly enough, there was a thunderstorm and a lightning storm. And as they buried these soldiers, lightning and thunder and, and stuff happened all overhead. And the men who were in the burial detail thought it was an appropriate uh, ending to their burial detail. Well, they stayed in those ground burial spots over in the canyon for almost two years. And then they decided to move them from there to the post cemetery at Fort Lapway. So what happens if you are buried in a fort cemetery and then they close the fort? Do you stay there? Well, they didn't want to do that. So they brought them back here again, dug them up, brought them here, and reburied them the third time here at Fort Walla Walla. And that's where they are today. Now, unfortunately, the soldiers who were buried were moved here in 1890. And we go back to talking about Sergeant McCarthy again. The coffin that brought the remains contained 26 skulls, fragments of skulls. Bones were shipped by steamboat and rail to Fort Walla Walla, November of 1890. And they were reinterred here November 12th of 1890. If you go down there now and look around, you will find some individual graves with individual names on it. But you will mostly find mass graves with the names of these people on it. They're in there somewhere, maybe. There's still a few bodies we haven't found yet. But they're there. Fort Walla Walla. When McCarthy realized that they were going to be reburied here, and he was living here, he decided that he and the other men of uh, Company F and H that had been in the battle, he contacted them, he took up some money, and he built, or had built, a monument that's still there today. It was erected in 1890, and it's still there, and it looks just like that. Uh, it hasn't been treated well. People have chipped on it, and, and some graffiti had to be cleaned off and so on, but it's there. And it was a fitting uh, memorial to the people that fought in the canyon and put there by McCarthy and his men. Now, September of 1919, the state of Idaho decides they're going to build a road down through that canyon, and they start building that road, and not too far from the top, they run across a body. And they understand that it's a soldier. It looks like him. It, it's got some remnants of uniform and other things on it. And of all things, they're able to identify him. So how do you identify a guy that's been laying up there since, what, 77 at least? And we don't know who he is. But when they started to dig him up and go through it, we think, the best guess is, it's uh, Private Hurlbert. And why do we think it's him? Well, for one thing, if you go down to the, the site, by the way, you'll see his name on the big monument, the mass grave, because they thought he was part of it. Then later on, they determine he isn't, and he gets his own separate grave where his remains are buried. But what made people think that it might be him he was the only married enlisted man. And as such, he probably had a wedding ring, which would mostly have identified him as this one man of all the men that were there that day. We don't know for sure, but we're pretty sure. Post cemetery, there was another small battle. Uh, as the Indians retreated, they came back up towards uh, uh, Cottonwood in that area, but they were doing it down along the river. Then they cut up over the banks and they were 
They were headed north. They wanted to get up onto the Lolo Trail. And in that process, a young soldier right out of uh, uh, West Point, been out of West Point maybe a year or so, his name was Lieutenant Rains, Sevier McClellan Rains. And he's given 10 men and two civilians to go out and, and uh, discover where these Indians are going. And he gets out there in the middle of nowhere, and sure enough, the Indians find him. And he and all of the men under his command are killed. And they're also buried down here today. Now, interestingly enough, Mr. Plucker and I, and mostly Mr. Plucker, uh, we looked around to see what we could find on Mr. Raines, found a picture of him. But more importantly, his classmates of 1876, the centennial year of the United States, all got together and made a plaque and had it installed in the chapel uh, down at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where he was stationed. And uh, Steve called the chaplain down there and asked him if he could take a picture of it, and there it is. So we know that he, was, he is buried down here in the cemetery, but he is remembered in Kansas as well as West Point. Remains of the men under his command are also buried down there. If you go down and look, you'll see Cottonwood Canyon, Idaho, July 3rd, 1877. Interestingly enough, uh, when did Idaho join the Union? July 3rd of 1890. It was interesting. There are other cemetery uh, stones down there. And if you go down and look, you're going to say, well, what did Martha have to do with the army? Well, it turns out Martha was a child. Uh, there were wives. There were some other civilians that are buried down in the cemetery as well. We don't have all the information on them yet. We're still trying to find that. Well, the Nez Perce War ended. You're probably familiar with that. Didn't last but a few months. Chased them all over the place to Montana. Uh, some of them chose to go to Canada. Some of them, like Chief Joseph, decided they'd stay right where they were. Uh, the war ended. Chief Joseph was moved on to a reservation up at Nez Pelham. Uh, others went to Canada and didn't come back. Yellow Wolf, he came back, told his story. Interestingly enough, General Howard and Chief Joseph met in Carlisle, Pennsylvania in 1904. Both of them sat down to dinner. And I find it interesting, and this tells you something about Howard and how he thought. And uh, he said, there are no people we honor more than the Indians. You will say, but didn't you fight the Indians? Yes, I am an army officer. I'd fight you if you rose up against the flag. Oh, oh, Howard. Chief Joseph said, when my friend, General Howard, and I fought together, I had no idea that we would ever sit down to a meal together, as today, but we have, and I am glad. I have lost many friends and many men, women and children, but I have no grievance against any of the white people, General Howard or anyone. And it speaks well of Chief Joseph. Imagine, anybody been to Carlisle Barracks? I grew up there. So I find it interesting. White Bird Battlefield today, if you go over and want to research this battle for yourself and find out more in detail and actually connect with the history by walking the trails and finding that out, uh, you can do it. The National Park Service has preserved some of it. Uh, it needs a lot of work. It's out in an isolated, lonely place, and it doesn't get visited too often by uh, people like us or uh, even the rangers there. And so you often have times by yourself that you can walk the trails, listen to the whispers of history. We make history and it follows us through time. We must always remember that we will be judged on what we do now by what those in the future who do not know us or share our world. We think about the people that are coming after us. Think of the people that came before us as well. Now, just for a few seconds, uh, I like this.
and a big thank you. Relationships are complex like they are with us, with everybody. There were there, but they weren't allied like we would think we're allied with Great Britain in this war. They were family members and people that were connected in other ways, but they were no allies. But they weren't ever identified because they were just affiliated with another tribe at that time. Yeah. They tried to make connections with the Crows and some others but they didn't want those headaches and troubles. And so they were pretty much on their own. Other questions? Oh. <laughs> There's another book, a very historical book about the Nez Perce War that encompasses uh, some of the books we've talked about. Mm -hmm. That's Nez Perce Summer of 1877 by Jerome Green. It's a good one. Very, very, very interesting. And it's, it's historical, it's not fiction. I think part of the problem with history today, people want it condensed in very small forms. So you get on the internet and you get on Wiki or somebody and they give you a really snapshot of it uh, without knowing all of the connections. Smohala, very important to the Indian story, not as important to the Nez Perce story. So it, it, it's good to know that because it shows some of the motivations, but not all of them and not directly affected. So. You, you have to have a much bigger picture of it, and I don't. I'll be honest with you. Uh, this is fairly new to me. I wanted to identify who those people were and how they got there and what they did. And to me, now when I walk down there and I see Sevier Rains or William Harbord or, or uh, uh, Sergeant Gunn or some of those, at least now I have some idea of who they are. They're not just a white marble uh, stone. They're somebody that you know what they did. Yes, I, I don't have enough information to tell you that any of them were connected with the battle. I, that I don't have. Do we have anything on them at all? My guess is they had some connection to the fort, possibly scouts, maybe married. I don't know. We, we have a lot to know. If you're into mysteries, join us. Yes. I want to make a comment on your uh, couple of photographs you did where the um, ghosts of the soldiers were riding through there. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like when I was at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. I mean, I could feel yeah. those guys coming up. Yes, the yeah. Did you feel that way? Yeah. Did that inspire you to make that? Yeah, I, I belong to the Bighorn Associates and all that. I'm interested in that. And there are often times, and, and most reenactors, most historians will tell you at some point or other, you get a chill. You can feel it in you, your soul. Yeah, you There's feel it. Another good book, uh, but I, I want to tell you too, that I work at Temuscalic quite a bit. I get the same feeling when I go down through some of their cemeteries. Mm. There's, there's something there. Yeah. Who knows what? There's another good book called uh, A Tough Trip Through Paradise by Garcia. A the about man. the Nez Perce War? Yeah, it's a, a guy that had a, a concession and he picks up one of the Nez Perce women and tries to bring her back. And uh, she looked for her dad, whose name was Red Heart, and she thought that the cavalry desecrated his grave in one of the canyons okay. by Big Hole. The name of it again? A Tough Trip Through Paradise by Garcia. Did you get that if you wanted that? It's in by a Garcia. paperback. Okay, thank you. You know the name? I don't have the fellow that's in charge of that here tonight, or I'd ask him. I, I don't know anything about that one. What, was he in the Army, or was he a civilian contractor? or Army. Okay. I think this was a year after the Little Big one. Yes. 51, 51 weeks. <laughs>
Yeah. But the sad part about it is, is there's been a lot of what I've read about Lewis and Clark that they probably would not have made it after coming over low, low pass and that, and then going back next year if they had Peterson and Mitchell out there. Especially with horses. We'll uh, come back and we'll talk about Lewis and Clark. Yeah. Yes. One other question. Um, as part of the American Trail, have you visited that big pool? Or do you know? You know, I haven't yet. That's on my list. You hear that? We have to go to the big hole. I'm, turn around and tell my wife that. You, you've got to go to the big hole. <laughs> the fellow that shot the guy 300 yards with the food board, do you know if it was a flint? I don't. I don't. He didn't say anything about that. That was a good question. What do I know about the ballistics and stuff of the smoothbore that shot the trumpeter? And, and I'm getting this from somebody who made a shot at 200 yards with a smoothbore and knows what he's doing. I honestly don't know. We don't know if it was a flintlock, cap gun, smoothbore, rifle. All he says is it was an old trade gun. All right, any other questions? Well, I appreciate you coming. I know it was a snowy, miserable night to come out, but... I appreciate you being here. James, do you have any words? Oh, Grover. Thank you all for coming out to the Museum After Hours. Every last Thursday of every month, we have these free lectures. So please come again. And it's the time of the year to renew your membership or get a new membership. Uh, so see us, see me here, James, about that. And thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next month is Terry Gottschall about baseball. Baseball and kind of the social history of baseball in the world. And there was a baseball at the court, too. All right. Thank you. Thank you.